Hello and welcome to this Small Sided Games webinar. Uh, this session is hosted by myself, Matt Portis. I'm the Physical Performance Education Lead in the Professional Game Team at the Football Association. And joining me for this session, uh, my colleagues from the Professional Game Team, uh, Paul Holder, Paul Lever and Ted Dale. Hello, everyone. Hi, Matt. Good evening. In this session, we're hoping to get through uh, three key areas around small-sided games. We're going to discuss and consider the benefits of small-sided games and uh, how small-sided games can help uh, a football player's development in the four corners. Uh, we're going to discuss the importance of uh, not just allowing players to play small-sided games, but the coaching of small-sided games. And we're also going to be placing some emphasis, some additional emphasis on the physical corner, uh, talking about movement skills, energy demands, and um, how the constraints of small-sided games can help player development in the physical corner. But why are we talking about small-sided games? Well, it's quite clear when we, when we scrutinize and um, dismantle the 11v11 game when we start to analyze uh, tactical strategies at the at the elite end of the game even that at various points within the game there are games going on within the game so the images that we have on the screen here for example uh, on the left hand side we've got a, a 5v4 um, game going on uh, to the left hand side of the of the defensive penalty area uh, on the right-hand side, we've got a 3v2, or you could even isolate that down to a 1v1 game uh, between Serling and Alexander-Arnold. Guys, it, this is something that resonates with you. We see this all the time, don't we? We talk about it, you know, breaking the game down and looking at the smaller battles that are going on. Yes, Matt, I think from uh, the first thing I noticed in the two, two uh, examples that you're showing is that if you expanded the squares you could it still it still represents a game so in the top left it could become 8v6 yeah but it's very very relevant to the game itself yeah. um and if you played that game in that part of the field then uh, you're truly getting a, a realistic uh, impact from from that kind of activity yeah i think i think the important point there is it, you know we're not just preparing all the time and thinking about 11 v 11 because that's not how the game's played. Sometimes it's these smaller battles that are going on and uh, they tend to be in um, smaller areas, tighter spaces, fewer numbers. Um, um, go on, Paul. Sorry, I, um, I think um, also when it comes to realism, if you see the both the instances is um, that the, the forwards in this instance are outnumbered. Yeah. yeah, you know, and you've got three defenders on the right, and um, two attackers, and on yeah. the left hand side, you've got more defenders than attackers. Now that should send a message about your practice numbers, and if you if you're practicing uh, attacking, if that's what you're doing, then that's the truth. That normally you're outnumbered. Yeah, you know, very seldom, because all the troops get back and try and stop you scoring. So it should trigger things about how you deploy those numbers. Yeah. And of course, from my, yeah, from my point of view as well, it's the, the specific kind of energy demands and physical, you know, usually these are the parts of the game that the players are in involved in because they're in and around the ball. So the intensity of play goes up, the demand on their energy systems, their, the speed of thought and movement needs to be, um, finely tuned and of high quality at this point in time. Um, so being able to train and prepare for these 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 um, parts of the game is really, really important from the physical point of view as well. And also recognising, Matt, if you just stay with that one, is that whilst there's high activity, let's take the right one uh, with the 3v2, whilst there's high activity going on here, on the far side, there's a lot of planning. Yeah. There's a lot of walking. There's a lot of preparing. You know, yeah. so it's low. 
low intensity there, if you like, in, in many in mentally and physically and, and, and everything else. And, and it's high here. Yeah. You know, and that's what we've got to recognize that it's not just because you're in the final third. It's not high intensity for everyone. No. So uh, that's the realism, I think. Absolutely. Paul Lever, do you want to take us through this to get get us started, please? Yeah, I mean, we're always linking this back to the physical wherever possible, but potentially the, the, the smaller numbers with the higher repetition, obviously we're trying to work the technical, but there's so many physical returns that will come from these, uh, these practices and these games. So initially, if you look at Mason Mount on the picture there, he's assessing if he's on the ball, right, who am I against? Is he stronger than me? If he is, I don't want to make it a physical contest. If he's right or left footed, tactically, I might look to attack one side. Is there any support behind? What am I going to do next? So, so as you look down the list, there's a lot of decision making going on. Mm. And we have to make sure that physically, uh, around what we're, we're trying to really hone into, uh, as well as the, the general four corner model, is that we've got to develop these players so they have a, a, a great list of tools that go in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. So they need to be able to go right, right, and left. They need to be as strong on the ball as they can relative to their obviously their, their body composition. But we've got to give them the opportunity to develop this specifically in the golden age of learning five to eleven. But linking into YDP. Um, these these play or these boys will go go through a, a, a growth spurt at some stage, and it might be a case that they may need to remyelinate. So we need to keep revisiting these small numbers. We, we have a real problem that we tend to want to go to eleven aside too quickly. We're going to lose the returns of the small sided games that I've just discussed if we get there too early, and the players don't get the opportunity to practice and develop these skills in the technical corner, the physical corner, and then working through the other two corners as we go. Very, it's crucial. Yeah. And what resonates with me is they are skills, aren't they, as well? So you've got to expose people to these situations throughout their development and continue to keep revisiting that because um, that gives them the opportunity to learn and to learn about what's possible from their own body so how strong am i relative to most of these other players you know can i can i hold players off am i quicker than most people um and and without exposing people to those situations and like you say revisiting that through stages of growth it's very very difficult for for players to know what's possible without them being exposed to that stuff really yeah we've um we we had a lot of examples over the years where boys who had good physical capabilities in 11 12 uh, pre growth spurt they suddenly go through growth spurt and they look like a broken wheel mm -hmm. that you know the size 12 feet under 12 uh you thinking he can't stand up yeah. he can't control his body but he's he's going through the situation where he might need to remyelinate that boy i've just mentioned i shan't mention his name he's now just transferred from a championship club to a premier league club mm. uh, he's he stayed in the system it's very important that we keep the players in not throw them out in ydp phase because they're going through so much 13 and 14 we have to make sure they can develop and revisiting small sided games a lot more is one of the key things that we need to do yeah. <clears throat> Matt, I think it's important if you go back to the individuals with that slide, is to uh, where the left hand side is leads to a demonstration of tactics. I think tactics is something that we really need to redefine because if you mention tactics to people, they pr pretty much go to formations and team stuff. But what Paul's saying there is that if the individual tactics don't work, mm. the unit tactics won't work and they're the team won't function properly. And so it's absolutely critical that players are exposed to practicing in trial and error those individual tactics. And then they develop a style. 
we don't use style you know we use style to to talk about artists and things like that but players have a certain style and they have a certain style according to their skills physical skills technical skills and what paul's saying there i i absolutely concur with is that we've got to through the ydp is give them more opportunities to develop the, this individual style and these individual tactics because we do a lot as we go to ydp there seems to be a trend towards more team tactics when you go into 11 v 11 but in the long run they won't work unless individual tactics are red hot and that's what i think that demonstrates demonstrates in that slide there Okay. I, I, I just, I'll just sort of throw my oar in at the end and, and concur with what both the Pauls have said. But when you look at that list, that they are the difference between getting a career in the game and not getting a career in the game. Most people who, who get to a point where they've got that opportunity in front of them, um, if they can't do those things in that list on a regular basis and on a successful basis day after day after day, then they won't have a career in the game. So, you know, the, the players need to be practicing these things. And, like, you know, we all know that you need to get them wrong probably more often than you get them right in order to learn. Um, they need to be doing this from as early an age as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, the, um, you know, the, this thing about is he faster than me and speed? You know, how often do we, we, teach dribblers just to focus on speeding up and slowing down the defender we do a lot on shifting the ball from side to side but actually the top dribblers don't move the ball from side to side that much what they do is they slow the defender down and speed him up and sometimes uh stop him dead with an, something to do and then move him again mm -hmm. you know and raheem sterling is a prime example of that he, he torments defenders by slowing them down and speeding them up and yeah. I think if we recognise that, that's where the realism comes in. You know, what skills, are, you know, what is it we really want these players to do? And they do that, don't they? Because they've, they've, they've got an awareness that their their ability to accelerate, so their ability to go yeah. from 0 to 60 is is much greater than, than most of the other players that they play against. And they've practised that over and over again, so they've got really good at doing it. Yeah, you've only got to play a tag game with, with young children to know that the best ones slow down, make you slow down, and then go again. Yeah. They don't necessarily change direction. They 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 do, but they, they focus on the speed. And I think that's something that we probably could do a bit more of. Yeah. Paul Levy, do you want to just talk us through the model that we're seeing in front of us and then we'll we'll have a bit more of a conversation around this stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information on that slide and we will develop some of the points as we go through the discussion. But the, if you look at the picture in the, in the middle, what we're really saying there is that if we can get the players to, as a beginner or through their development phases, a wide variety of experiences, whether that be uh, multi-sports, whether that be through different types of sports-specific practice then the expert skill level will be wider if we have a narrow uh, group of experiences so we only ever play football and it's quite a uh, quite um, norm normal that it doesn't have much variety then that will eventually give you a narrow uh, skill set as you develop through and what we're trying to do is develop a high level of uh, physical ability to make sure that the toolbox the players have, that they're able to, uh, they've got good ABCs, they are quick, they they can resist pressure, uh, they are, they have the ability to make quick decisions in tight areas. So, so we're making sure they get a, a real wide variety of experiences. I mean, even if I just take football as, a, as an, the example, the constraints you put on the, the games you play, whether that be... Uh, Ted's going to talk about uh, space as regards to the area size and shape as the size. I'm looking at more around competitive ladders and ladders and training, mixed age football, uh, how you select your your teams. Example, it might be that at 12, 13 and 14, you suddenly decide to say, OK, Ted, I want you this morning. Uh, you're going to take the 14s. 
they're the best decision makers and we and we already know the other club does know this is going to happen so our best decision makers are going in the 14s or the uh, number three game in our middle game we're going to put the big athletes uh, that they're, they're going to go in because they're early matures and they're going to play in that group and then in the other game we're going to play the uh, more late developers who aren't necessarily the good decision makers some of them not all of them so we, we're grouping our boys uh, in different ways mm. and then we can rotate the coaches through those age groups so you can probably take 36 players to one venue three subs uh, and that's it they're all playing if you were playing 11 aside if you took 39 you might play four nines with three subs so that's what really we're starting off uh, with that slide good so we t we talked about the experiences and yeah some of those experiences to broaden broaden your experience might be from outside football and the the other general sport or physical activity that the kids do but how does how does small sided games then add to the experiences of the players um as they progress through football how is that adding to the experiences that they get to widen that uh widen the experiences that they get as they develop well is that open to anyone matt or is that for okay, yeah please um well from my point of view i would just suggest we, we i think that something that's becoming quite popular now is to talk about variety and volume um and if you look at the variety and i, I I absolutely hear what Paul's saying there about the value of, of other sports and, and activities outside of the game. But if we just focus on, on those involved in the game at the moment, basically the game gives you everything you need. You know, it's a, it's a one cap fits all things. It touches every corner all the time. Um, yeah, we take people out of the game to maybe focus on specific things here and there. But as I'm going to talk about later, I'm concerned a little bit around the not just the variety or the volume, but also the balance of activities. And I think uh, you know maybe maybe we we might have that slightly wrong at the moment. And, and and again, I'll touch upon that touch upon that in a minute. But I think the wide variety, the wide experiences, is key. But you could you could see that as wide experiences across the small sided game spectrum. Mm. Right. So thinking about the individual player, Paul Lever, that player of the syllabus that's part of our uh, of our coaching curriculum and coach coach education awards, how are we kind of going to be thinking about individual players and and how small sided games might help them? You gave examples of grouping players, but maybe a little bit more specific about individual players and how it can help them. Well, I mean, if you link to one of the core strands of the Advanced Youth Award, it's very important that within within our practices uh, that will involve small-sided games as well, that we plan for the different experiences of the different groups of players. So, example, uh, I've got a late maturing, um, high decision-making player. So I may pit I may pit him against a similar type of player again to to. to to make sure that he does have to be quick and sharp, or I may pit him against a big player. Again, he'll have to play even quicker then because he doesn't want it to become a physical battle. Um, I may pit him on different parts of the pitch. So the experiences of uh, playing central midfield where he's got to work on a 360 basis compared to uh, playing at centre-back where he's working in 180, all the plays in front. I have to make sure that he gets as many experiences as possible. And again, we sometimes might have to, um, I mentioned the boy under 12 at the 12, size 12 feet who needed careful monitoring through 12, 13 and 14 to make sure he, may, he stayed in the programme and maintained his conference. We have another boy now who's playing uh, centre-back in the Premier League, doing really well. And he really found it hard around the under 13, 14 age group, struggled with his quickness of his feet, struggled with his mobility around the pitch because he was six foot one at the time. Yeah. So we just, again, look to monitor how much he played. We look to monitor uh, the positions he played to give him the opportunities to get minutes. Um, and and it's, it's really crucial that we do work on those individual plans so A, we know when they're going through the growth spurt. B, we can tailor the programme. And C, we can still make sure that he keeps developing 
the physical requirements of the game. Yeah. And it's I think if, if you expo ex expose a player like that into like a small sided game, for example, then one, we're reducing the amount of high speed running that they have to do because the areas are smaller and there's fewer. But they're also having to work on things like their balance and coordination, which are really tested in that example that you gave. So from a physical point of view, you can really see how putting a kid in a who's struggling with 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 kind of balance and 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 movement and quickness of feet by overloading it in that small sided environment, but also reducing the amount of high speed running they're having to do. It's going to protect them from getting the growth related injuries, but it's also going to help them with some of the other kind of physical motor qualities that are adapted when they're going through the growth and maturity as well. I mean, you really take, you're taking them back to what you want your foundation program to look like initially. So yes, it's a technical program, but if we don't get the physical part right, forget it because they won't have the, the ABCs and the quickness to be able to play the game at the highest level anyway. And all we're doing in the YDP is making sure we develop, <coughs> excuse me, develop and then make sure that they get the opportunity once they do go through the growth spurt to keep maintaining the physical literacy. Massive. And small-sided games is one of the best ways of allowing this to happen because they're working physically, they're working high uh, psychologically on the decision making. Teamwork is crucial. So one of the high returns on if you work on small sided games or futsal is that you, your decision making to try and win that tactical game. The smaller the numbers, the more tactical it might become. Absolutely. I guess. I guess what we're talking about there is, is around like individual. Uh, development plans and how maybe small sided games can help that. Um, Noddy, have you got anything to come in, in with at this point? I think the diagram mm. is, is terrific. And don't forget that can apply to coaches as well. Oh. You know, because uh, if you've got wide, if you're a coach, and let me, and we are talking to coaches, if you uh, have got broad experiences, and that means that you don't then go to 11 v 11 and that's you done. Yeah, that you actually keep those experiences open, then you can still be a top close, you know, a top manager, but your expert, your skill level is quite wide. So I think that diagram can apply to coaches as well as players. Absolutely. The other thing is, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm taking it from a tactical point of view that if you took sort of some of the like um, countries <clears throat> that adopt basketball, futsal, handball as, as essential in primary schools, they're tactically their tactical experiences are quite similar, but they're different sports. So their experiences are, in fact, broad, but they keep repeating similar tactical problems. Mm. And it's no coincidence that Spain uh, are big on basketball, in, in basketball, futsal, handball. They've all got very similar tactical outcomes. Mm. And uh, they therefore become very broad in terms of experts around those sports but they're tactically they've got common threads that run through them mm. so i think that's interesting the tactical the tactical side of it and uh i do think i do think that there is a correlation between play and you imagine the game let me jump forward a bit you imagine the game in five years time where you've got different formations occurring um in one game so people change formations according to the situation. You could be playing three or four different formations in 90 minutes. Mm. Uh, you could have players that come on that are wrong, wrong sided. You know, you have subs that come on for particular impacts. You'll have faster defenders, faster players. So actually you've got to adapt to that. And so you have to have these pretty wide skill sets. I think, the alternative to that is, you, of course, you do get players who have limited, you know, start football at five and that's all they do and they specialise in football and, they, yeah, they get to the top. But essentially, looking forward, you want the expert to have a wide skill set if you can. So I think it's a really sound diagram. Good. OK, let's think about, let's think about constraints and, and move on to move on to you ted and think about um let's start the conversation around different pitches different dimensions that we might use for some of the small-sided games 
Okay, the listening to Noddy there, Paul, uh, he used the word adapt, uh, which which is a, a sort of a precious word with me at the moment. And if we want players to be capable of adapting when they're, you know, at the sharp end of, of, of the profession, then they need to be practicing adapting all the way through. And in order to do that, we need to provide them with a diet that has volume, has variety, has depth, has meaning and relevance. And the concern for me at the moment is, is maybe that through often through what appears to be no fault of their own, coaches are quite constricted as to what kind of diet and menu they can offer their players. Um, but however, looking at it, I, I also think, on the other hand, that uh, some of the thinking lacks, uh, lacks a little bit of the imagination and creativity and could be a little bit more outside the box um, around size of areas, how they manipulate those areas. You know, so we want areas where, you know, we want the variety got to include, you know, parity, overload, underload, wide pitches, narrow pitches, long pitches, small pitches, pitches that, are, that maybe have got too much space so that we prioritise when to work, when not to work. All of that kind of stuff needs to be thrown in there. Uh, and I have a personal concern, and, it, and I have to say that at this time, it does lack any kind of supportive depth of evidence. There is some evidence out there, but the depth of evidence still needs to be uh, sort of put together and, and before I can be absolutely certain about this. But um, yeah, that that lack of, you know, listening to coaches saying uh, we can't do that because we only train on this on this space. And the space is restrictive, so therefore we can only do these things, uh, whatever these things are. So there was a comment the other day about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, about the players being unable to practice extended running because the the area size that they train on is too small. Um, but but a lot of that might be attributed to the way they divvy up the space, and and how they communicate with each other and collaborate with fellow coaches around. You know what? What are we? What are we all doing tonight? Not what am I doing tonight, but what are the other guys doing tonight? And is there a way in which I can, you know, grab some land from somebody else? Yeah. Shall we put your um your slide on at this point, and you can talk us through it? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> if if you if you see in the top right hand corner, so th the coaching question the other day spoke about only having a third of the field. And I said to him, I, well, I bet I bet the third of the field goes from touchline to touchline. And, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that if that if that's your space. But if that's always your space, week in, week out, session after session, then you are going to be limited in, to some degree as to what you can and can't do. And, and if, if the group numbers increase to four and you go down the quarter of a field route and you, you stick with the traditional way of chopping up the space, of course, we're going to go with that that equal area uh, idea, and and I'm not saying that that is wrong. What I'm saying is there are other ways of doing it, and we need to be a little bit more um, <clears throat> expansive with our thinking and looking at the space and saying, if you shift across to the left hand side of the diagram, you can see thirds of the field still the same, but they're from end to end. And I remember a colleague of ours, uh, Mick Matthews, talking about. Uh, a group that he was watching and they were trying to do some counter-attacking activity and the comment came in, oh, we struggle to do that because we've only got a quarter of the pitch or we've only got a third of the pitch. And, and Mick threw this suggestion and said, well, why don't you play end-to-end? -end? Mm. Uh, then you've got plenty of land to practice on. The game won't look exactly the same as you want the game to look, but it will allow you to practice a certain element of the game that at the moment you're saying you're not able to do. So um, again, by, by that little bit more of inventive thinking and the, the diagram underneath that also shows thirds of the field, but not every third is exactly the same in terms of its of its width and length. Mm -hmm. So you've got one group working in a, in a long, narrow strip and then two other groups working in, in, you know, almost, they're probably rectangular and these are not scaled drawings by any means. Um, 
and then I come to the one at the bottom underneath that where, where, where the words say, when do we ever see this type of thinking? So it, if, if you want to play a game, a competitive game, irrespective of numbers, but you have, there's your field in the middle, in the middle of the, of the big field. And then you've got all your other activities going on around it in, in certain areas. Now that, that area would cater for six working groups. Two groups would be playing a game. Uh, and then the other four groups would be would do, be doing smaller activities around the outside. And across on the right hand side, I just started to fiddle around with a with a little example. So there's a seven v seven going on in area three, two goals at one end and one goal at the other. And then in in the narrower strip, um, you've got some one v ones going on, and you've got four two v twos going on. So that's that's almost not far short of 40 players have been catered for and there's still space at the far end that can be occupied. Um, and it doesn't have to look like that every week. It, it, it can be different depending on, you know, where we're at with our programme, what we want to do tonight, what, what, what our aims and outcomes are, and more importantly, the collaboration with, with colleagues around the sharing of space uh, and ideas. And I come back to that, um, the club that, where we, we identified that they were currently on a 15 to 1 ratio in favour of non-small-sided game activities. So they, they were still doing football, don't get me wrong, um, but they weren't, they weren't games, they weren't competitive games as, as we, would, we would understand them to be. And I think we may, have, may be the victims at the moment of a glut of demand for timetable space. Um, lots of activities are deemed to have value. And, and and want this want their place on the timetable, and I think there there might need to be some um, reviewing of that and a little sit back and say, okay, what what's really important? What what's a non-movable that's got to go in first, and then the other stuff can 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 shape itself around that. Because if at the end of the day, and I know we're not going we're not advocating that you just play a game, I know that, but if you did just play a game, it would hit all four corners all the time. Uh, you're playing games in different um sure yeah and yeah. Uh, the pitches with different because from a physical point of view that you're then giving the players the opportunity to to practice to build their capabilities of yeah I'm, I'm thinking about that again in the top left there that you've got the the long pitches well you know high speed running opportunities to get up to high speed practicing practicing sprinting running at high speed recovering going again so yeah high speed running and, and building your building your aerobic system but then some of your practices in the bottom right that are really tight small spaces uh, and some of the kind of 2v2 3v3 practices they're going to help you not only um work on kind of changing direction agility being able to move in the skills of being able to move in tight spaces but also give you the opportunity to grow and develop your anaerobic aspects of the game, which we know are really, really important. And I think you you made a really important point about um, play and competition there, because from a physical point of view, as soon as you introduce competition, as you all know, that drives the intensity of the practice. So you're probably going to get more out of the players in terms of explosive actions and their 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 effort to want to push themselves, run a bit yeah. further, run a bit faster, jump yeah. a bit higher because of the competition. Yeah, and there's probably, you know, many, many ways of, of dividing the field up. And I've just used two or three examples of how that might be so that the pitch in the centre of the field might be shorter and narrower, which would give you more space around the outside. Again, that comes down to negotiation and, and discussion with colleagues, not not in the moment but prior to going out there so that you you all agree what's going on and you know it's almost like saying well i'm booking the field first i'm on there we're playing a game first and then you guys come on you get your turn you get your turn uh as and when um i i, I just worry i was I, I, I did uh i was listening to some guys this afternoon talking about set plays and again one of them used and i'm going to say the excuse and it's not meant to be a derogatory comment but the, so we don't practice set plays because we never never get access to the appropriate geography and let field markings in order to make it worthwhile. And, and I said to him, is that simply 
due to the tradition of the way you chop up your your working spaces uh, and he said it probably is you know because they're so so used to doing it a certain way the the other thing ted and uh is um you know the the idea of changing the way that you construct sessions so the carousel idea of moving round from if you took your pitch and you said right i'm i'm there for 20 minutes then i'm going round we all shuffle round after a certain time so we all experience the different thing you know there is there's lots you can do in your planning there is a pre there is a thing about people going right that's my land and I'm doing a technique practice, going into a skill practice, going into a game, and uh, I'll see you at seven o'clock. Yeah. And there's also a thing about age groups staying the same. Yeah. So they're reluctant to shift round, you know. Uh, yeah. And if you blend age groups and change your thinking slightly to a more flexible approach, you could you could uh, you could build all those outcomes in in one session you know you just shift around from a to b to c to d it's yeah planning. And, and always at the back of my mind is is that idea of volume and variety um in order to do that you can't you can't or when i say can't i don't mean it like that you you should try to avoid <clears throat> excuse me working in the same area in the same place every single time you practice because that will obvious have obvious constraints on what you can and can't do you know it's it's good in in the short term because you learn how to use that particular space but you also need to learn how to manage big spaces and i'm forever seeing you know some groups will be allocated for example a quarter of a pitch and then when they play their game they'll play their game on a on a half of a quarter of a pitch mm. So an eighth of a pitch in the end. So there's always space available on the field, and then they come back with, "Yeah, we can't do that because we don't get enough room." I mean, yeah, I think as the uh, as coaches, we've got to be able to, as Ted's talking, be able to work with a variety of different types of space, as in size and shapes, and then not, not even alluding to, we've got to be aware of the types of practice structures that we can use to facilitate the players' learning. And then also we've got to make sure that within the games, we're able to then put constraints on that allow different returns. For example, it might be uh, we're looking at uh, fullback. So, so he's getting lots of potential to get long aerobic running, uh, getting on the overlap quite a lot. So we just constrain the practice where the um, left midfield playing against the fullback isn't allowed to recover into his own half which means that the fullback can get on the overlap and then has to recover because potentially if they don't score, the ball goes straight into that midfield player who hasn't trapped back and they're on the counter. So he has to recover. Yeah. That also might be that that player's on a, on a low load because, again, he's had an injury or he's coming up from growth spurt or he's maybe a, a, a cross-country run at school prior to the session and we can still by constraining the practice, get him in, because he's working on receiving, turning, playing quick and sharp inside the pitch, and we're allowing the fullback to bomb on and get physical returns and loads of crosses. So that's just one example of constraining. Uh, and we as coaches have to be very good at planning and designing with the MDT team to allow that to happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And I assume it's not just about, you know, dividing your pitch up and letting this happen it's got to be you've got to get the realism in there as well as i'm suggesting and and not just the realism but, but also guiding the kids not just through the constraints but helping them to understand things that are going to help them when then the game go, goes into an 11 11 v 11 game as well would, would, would yeah. you agree? I, I think um another point might be matt as well to look at uh, Paul Holder but sort of touched upon it around looking at combining age groups um, not just working you know as we talk about not just working horizontally across an age group but looking at saying okay it might be the nines and tens trained together mm -hmm. instead of you having 16 in your squad you're actually working with 32 players so some of those players could be off you know in a game somewhere so others could be doing other more specific stuff around similar to what Paul was just describing around 
the left back, the left midfield player, but, but also doing it in an area of the field that has some relevance and some transference to what they were doing doing a game. Um, and I think sometimes when you look at that and say, well, rather than be hindered by only having 14 in the group or only having 12 in the group, if we combine the groups, we've now got a team of staff, a larger group of players, but we are operating as one, one group that inevitably leads back to the point around pre-planning, collaboration, understanding exactly what's going on. What are we after? What are we going for? How are we going to, how are we going to utilize the resources at our disposal? And the only people who put at the moment, certainly in, in some of the clubs I work with and other people may have different examples. Sometimes the constraints are self-inflicted. Yes. Because, because of the way they insist on traditionally approaching the challenge. Absolutely. It's a great yeah. point that said out. I mean, my thoughts were drawn to uh, we involve the sports scientists, we involve the more importantly, the goalkeeping coach. Uh, the goalkeeper coach could work with the with the back four. The goalkeeping coach could work with a group of strikers if we yep. were going to be position specific higher up the uh, the YDP phase. But we as coaches, again, we have to make sure we upskill ourselves. So we as coaches need to have an opinion and have an understanding around sports science. We don't have to be a sports scientist, but we need to have an understanding. We yep. also need to have an opinion on goalkeeping, so therefore we need to know something about goalkeeping. But that is also, conversely, goalkeepers need to step up to the fore, and some do, and I'm not so sure all do, that they can also conduct a practice that involves outfield players and goalkeepers. So it's a two-edged sword. We've just got to get better as coaches, as a group of coaches, which also includes us as coach developers. Sure, sure, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Yes. This what you've just described here for me as well, Ted, is it's a great example about how you broaden the experiences. So if we think about going back to this slide, if we're always training on quarter of a pitch or third of a pitch, are we broadening the experience? If we're then only going into, like we said, we referred to before, the kids are only ever competing 11 v 11 uh, at a weekend in their own age group where we're only training and we get that very narrow. So it, we're not exposing the kids to all the aspects of the physical and technical aspects of the game that they could be developing if we're just a little bit more creative about how we train in an integrated way, so to develop physical and technical skills uh, within the training session, but also how then how then we, we take that into games as well. I yeah. think, Matt, if you don't mind sticking with that diagram, and Paul, Paul Lever um, mentioned it and... and quite right about position specific and you got to be careful about how early you do that because that red box could shrink dramatically if you go position specific too early and what you do is you come into you have these wide brilliant experiences at 9 10 11 12 and then you jump into 11 v 11 and then you so you tend you could be in an environment where you're pigeonholed mm. therefore all your experiences will be shrunk mm. according to position and we should be looking you know there's a great term and uh, it's position in not position you know if kids have got to get positioning right in other words in their head a tactical understanding of positioning that means broad experiences it's positioning not position that matters. You can get your position later. And I think because we rush, and I, I don't mind saying it, you know, as a, as a criticism, because it is, is that we rush towards 11 v 11. We prepare for 11 v 11. <laughs> we go, oh, we're playing 11 v 11 at 12, so we'll prepare at 10 or 11. Oh. So there's a preparation stage. So it's, it's not even that if you jump into 11 v 11 at under 13, or whatever it is now, they're under 12, uh, uh, and you go, oh, yeah, but we better do it uh, when they're under 11 because they're playing 11. And therefore, you, you, by definition, start selecting people into positions too early. And that diagram will bite you in the backside if, if, if you, you continue to do that. Now, there are forwards and out-and-out out forwards that you know need to be scoring goals to be the top liners. I get that. But the majority of players 
uh, probably that specialisation red box shrinks dramatically too early. Do you think? Oh, it's no, no. Sorry, sorry, one Paul. Uh, I was just going to bring. We had a discussion yesterday around most players when they debut don't debut in, in the, the position, position they, yeah. they yeah. start off at. So if you take for example, so the one we talked about yesterday. So Stephen Gerrard started off as a central midfield player potentially mm. in a group. He debuts at right back. If you remember in the World Cup, there was a big hoo-ha about him. They weren't really sure whether he could play in the midfield with uh, with Redknapp. Sorry, with Lampard. So he played wide left. When Gerard Houllier comes in, he plays as a 10. So he's now in a different, a completely different position again. And he, But he's probably known uh, throughout his career as a box-to-box -box midfield player. So there, there's four areas or four positions he's had to become quite good at. So it's our role to make sure that all the players get the opportunity to be able to play in all those positions. They will start to specialise a little bit more as they get up the YDP phase. But if I'm always playing, say, an example as a holding midfield player in a in a in a three, I never get the chance to go box to box. So if I'm a, if I'm in a development group, uh, I'm never going to be able to get box to box because I never have to. I never have to defend one v one. So all, think about all the physical literacy that's involved in 1v1 defending. I don't have to do it because I've got cover in front and I've got cover behind. Well, th this is the benefits of small-sided of small -sided games is, is you take the position out and get to positioning. Yep. You know, you, you actually are – it's an, an essential stage that you have to keep revisiting. And what Ted's saying is, is if you play 4v4 on a big pitch, you go box to box. You know, there is – you know, you can get – the outcomes you want uh, according to changing the pitch size and all that. We know that. But I think it's a really important point because uh, this position, this desire to go position specific too early is narrowing the experiences of the kid physically, technically and in his head all, all, all across the, the four corners. And I think we have an obligation to say, well, Maybe the temptation to do that with small sided games is, is lessened. You know, maybe maybe it softens and you need to do more of it. I think as well, Paul, the the the, the demands of the modern game are are not allowing players to focus on single positions. Oh, absolutely. And, and even years ago, you know, the Leeds United fans will will thank me for this. Uh, there was a utility player called Paul Maidley who yeah. played played for England, played for Leeds. Yeah. Out, you know, superb player, and I suppose in a way, he was he was back in the day the 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 modern day version of him is now James Milner, and and how James Milner has you know had a fabulous career, not not labelled as as being in any one position. Even Phil Neville, the same, watching him on TV the other night talking about how he played in a variety of positions and how the manager of the club at the time said he. He wanted him in his squad because of his versatility. Mm. So whilst you you don't want to be a, a you know a master of one and a jack of, you know jack of all trades type thing, you don't want to be necessarily that. But at the same time, an appreciation and an ability to have more more than one string to your bow is is, is vital. I think now in in, in well, the it, of a career in the game, it goes back to the your point, all our points about individual tactics you, that you have to be a master of them irrespective yeah. of the position you're in. And if you think that coaches, top top coaches now, or, you know, he, you know, even some of the older coaches will change formations as they go along. You know, you've got to adapt to that. So yeah. what is a position? You know, yeah. suddenly you're there and then you're popping up somewhere else. So yeah. I think we have to be, really be future-proof. Matt, the um, I was just going to mention to you about the. Is it worth bringing to to the table the fact that we deliberately took numbers off of that diagram? Absolutely, yeah. Because we don't want to. We we didn't want people to think that at certain ages, you know, wider experiences ends and specialization begins. It's it's a fluctuating process, isn't it? It's a continuum, and it's very much individually dependent on where the player's development is at that at any given moment and who they are yeah yeah you know i mean if if that was a goalkeeper yeah 
you know, his specialization in normally they, you know, they're position specific from very early. Yeah. You know, so it is, it's nothing to do with age. It's to do with their skills journey, where they are and what, what they're going to contribute later on, you know, mm. some mm. forwards yeah. will I mean, always be have been forwards since they were six. Absolutely. You know, you know, just, just to, before we move on to the kind of final part of this session, you know, I think from the, the other thing to point out from the physical point of view, I always like to look at it about thinking about the end in mind. What are the what are the players, what are we trying to develop the players for? What's the environment that they're going into? And what are the physical challenges that they, they face within that? And um, if we, we're promoting players into senior teams, then they're going to have those one-on-one -on -one battles that they're going to have to face in their first training session. They're going to be maybe facing a player who's playing at greater intensity than they've potentially faced before, who has some kind of movement and, and competencies that they've maybe not met before. Um, but also, you know, the players are players at that level have to every week they're training, you know, senior players train at least one day a week in it, in it when they've got one game a week. They'll train in small-sided games to maintain the high-intensity levels of the elite game. And so if first-team players need that, because without that, they're not going to be able to be ready to compete at top level, then we've got to think about, well, how does that then not only prepare the players physically, but also develop them technically for the, those elements of the game that they need at the end of their development journey? Mm. I'm not sure, Matt, where we where we would put questions, but so if you if you just go back to my slide, um, I'd like to tag something on the end of that and ask ask the you know the people who watch this uh, and listen to this to think about um, one the, the the ratio of practice activities compared to uh, let's call it SE, SSGs uh, small sided game activities. Um, and I know there's there's some discrepancy as to what we'd actually clarify as a small sided game, but I, I suppose anything that is opposed competitive, whether it's one v one, two v two, three v two, five v five, nine v nine, whatever, um, because the example I quoted, the fifteen to one um, ratio, I think I don't think anybody would disagree and and say that that wasn't you know that wasn't comfortable. We we would need to review that and have a look at that. So I'd be interested to know what other people's uh, numbers look like uh, and, and also whether or not they think they have an appropriate depth, variety and volume in, 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 the, in, their, in their diet, in their small-sided games diet at the Absolutely. moment. Because that will help, help me put my thinking in, in, in a better place as to how extensive, you know, is this an issue, is this an issue that, that spreads wider than than one club or is it just just specific to this one club absolutely great question Robbie, over to you do you want to tap into this a little bit and then and, well, and I, th I think to tie up is, is just to be clear of that irrespective of the numbers that you've got in your practice that you uh you head for the three r's which is relevant to the players and you you decide what you want to repeat it's all very well getting the numbers right and getting the area size right but you, you really got to know what you're going after mm -hmm. and you know as directional as possible as often as possible because that's the realism mm -hmm. and realism is it often traps you so in that example you've got is Raheem Sterling plus one other up against three defenders mm -hmm. you know it isn't four attackers against two. Now, when you're much younger, that would help you understand and that, that's it. But as you get into the YDP and stuff, that come, you know, that's the reality. And in midfield, you're pretty much matched up unless someone overloads. And Ted's right about overloading, big principle about overloading. It's not giving you an overload. It's creating overloads and, and dealing with underloads. And, and it's those tactical things. And also um, when you're practicing and, and, and particularly in the physical stuff is, is to see things 
before the during and after which everyone's probably familiar with but i think the after is pretty much neglected yeah i think people if you do receiving skills for example i think people are pretty au okay. there's a much work to be done on the before and what you do with it but what do they do afterwards mm. you know it used to be liverpool you say pass and move or Manchester United, whoever it was but something happens afterwards it isn't a physical turn off once you've executed something so shots for example how often do we do a shooting practice and then watch what the kid does afterwards do they just go oh i've missed so i'm turning around and going back or are they following up with a sprint or a little two-step movement to go for rebounds because that is a right quite an intense movement you know and and it's following the after and i think it, that's about the detail and I think <laughs> the after is is something that we could all work really hard on you yeah. know uh and the next bit for me is is some byproducts if you go to the next slide and um, if you don't mind um is um the processes that we go to you know like brain to grass is 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 um aaron danks is 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 um he owns that statement but i've openly nicked it so um so thanks aaron so basically you observe the game this is in order to get the realism you put the skills under the microscope you want to practice you take the skills out you stick them in some sort of order that you want them and you practice them and then you watch for transfer that's pretty simple and uh you can pretty much work on all areas of that but what i'm interested in the box of small-sided games is they can help you as a coach build your observation skills because there's less players there's less noise in inverted commas it's not a noisy practice there's not so much disruption going on so actually and there's a lot of repetition so as a coach we should be really training ourselves to look in small sided games and when we do it coach properly whatever forgive the term properly but coach in those small sided games don't just put them on mm -hmm. because you have an opportunity to observe positioning the skills the individual tactics whatever you're looking at you have an opportunity to see it right in front of your face happening time and time again and pretty much you narrow the search and you concentrate and isolate and all that stuff and then you learn to notice things it's very hard to 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 in in when you're taking an 11 v 11 there's so much going on yeah. and so you shift but small sided games gives you an opportunity as a coach it also gives you an opportunity to build relationships with the players because you're having input to them more often mm. you're actually referring to them more often now there is a danger you end up talking to them too much but there's a two byproducts you build your observation skills and you enhance relationships with the players now if anyone said what some of the value what the important aspects of coaching is is to have good observation skills and build relationships well small sided games can help you with that do you think do you think do you think coaches underestimate that do you think that small sided games are under coached yes i do i do and i, I think I'll, I'll give you i'll give you I'll give you a tactical thing, and, and I use this quite widely now, and I, I use the word shape, yes, and I hear it a lot. When teams don't have the ball at 11 v 11. Now, I think shape is vital when you do have the ball, and it's vital when you're playing 4 v 4 and 5 v 5 and 3 v 3 because it, it can help with your positioning. And yet it's something we're reluctant to use as we go down the numbers. And I think that is just one example of where we stop uh, or we don't think that some of the coaching points that we've got in 11 are as relevant in 3v3s. In answer to your question, yes, I don't think we do it enough. I don't think we observe the skills enough. And I don't think we practice coaching enough in those those games and ted's right it could be anything up to 9v9 whatever you determine small sided you know 3v2s 3v3s yeah and just what re resonated with me to link it back into the to the physical corner what you were talking about there in terms of you know I, we often talk about players not just being fit but being fit for purpose yeah that, that fit for purpose might be the 
capability of being able to switch position and play in different parts of the field. Mm. Um, but, you know, unless the practice is, regardless of whether they're small-sided, you know, 2v2s or 9v9, unless they have that realism and, and relevance to what the player needs, mm. you're actually practicing developing movement skills and developing the energy systems for something that they're not going to use in the game. So it, it all links together. It all... You know, you've got to get the three R's right to, to develop the, the physical qualities of the players in the right way as well. You do, and, and I will refer to it, but I, I, I am absolutely adamant that the more small-sided games that we do uh, for the right reasons, the, the better your observation skills will be of the skill of the individual players. And if you're telling me that um, it's all about the individual then you better have good eyes. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Just before we, we conclude, just to wrap this up, I'll come to Paul Lever first. Paul, just if you were to give the coaches one big takeaway from the discussion we've had over the last hour, what would your takeaway message to people be from this? I think a lot of the time I've talked about making sure that the individual, you're developing him or her over the four, over four corners, so our planning with the with the other staff, the design of your practice, the challenges you put within the practice, allowing the individual to develop across the four corners, it goes back to that. Brilliant. Ted? It would come back to that, uh, the supplying of an appropriate diet of, of practice activities and I'm not not discounting anything at all. I just just want coaches, clubs, heads of coaches, everybody involved to be happy that what they're providing their players is balanced and uh, doesn't leave anything out that they they deem to be important. But for me, the emphasis has to be on the game, and the best way to replicate the game is to play the game. But we need to play it in a whole variety of forms. So that so that when people come to step onto the onto the field or pursue a career in the game, they're more than just familiar with it. They're very confident that they can cope with the variety of demands thrown at them. And Noddy, I just think the realism, relevance, and the repetition will will come straight to the fore. But I do think that coaches should really have another look at the value of small sided games, the, the byproducts of it like I said, about observations, relationships, and so on and so forth, and be careful of position-specific. Great. And for me, I think, this, you know, small-sided games add to that diet. They add to the, they add the, to the variety when, when with the appropriate volume. They'll, they'll help the players to develop and overemphasise movement skills and elements of energy system development that you don't get in the, in the larger-sided game. So... We need to get a combination of that into the player's development so they can maximise the development of, of those skills and, and, and stuff as well. So that brings an end to, to this session. hope you found some elements of that useful. Have a, have a think about the use of small-sided games with your own players, uh, the way that you might practice and, and design your practices thinking about the three R's and the size and shapes of the field and the player numbers that you use. And hopefully we'll see you back for another, another webinar very soon. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Night. Good night.